What's in a name? Turns out quite a lot, actually. Hello humans, my name is Dale Kingsville. Never mind the background, don't worry about that. It's not important right now. What's important is that a few weeks ago on the Eldritch Lorecast, we had a question about how to name things in your fantasy tabletop RPG setting. And I haven't really been able to stop thinking about it since. So here, here are my extended thoughts on that for you now to have. Generic NPCs I've talked a little bit about before. I know a lot of people swear by the age-old hack of uh, having a bunch of different lists kind of divided by ancestry, you know, so you have your, your sort of orcish names and your elfy names and your gnome-esque names. For me this system lacks some um, some efficiency? That feels like a weird word choice, but I, it is what I feel in my heart. You get to have a list of orc names and a list of dwarf names, and let's be honest, the names are going to be like 78% interchangeable. Secondly, because I feel like you're going to be in the middle of describing this, this gnomish blacksmith who's, you know, completely cut and has a neck the size of a tree trunk because he's just that fit and strong and built like a, a brick outhouse. And then you'll go to check your list of gnomish names and it'll be like, this is Threadneedle, or, or this is Shrink Lily. You know what I'm saying? What I do is very similar. Um, I do have my separate lists, but I separate them based on sort of um, qualities or personality traits. I find it really, really easy to use the six core stats as your base list concepts, right? So you have your wise sounding names, your strong sounding names, your names that seem uh, sneaky and lithe. This approach is very kiki booba. Don't get in the weeds about it. Just, just vibe it out. Just vibe it out. Does this name seem strong? Yeah, sure. So to give you an example, a name like Brutus or Ajax, right? That's a, that's a strong sounding name. You could throw those names on pretty much any warrior, be they orc or human or dwarf, or a halfling even. Chuck it on any strong character and it'll probably fit. It will not, however, fit the scrawny little wizard's apprentice that you've just introduced. Or at least it won't fit them unless you want it to be hilarious, I guess. When it comes to naming places, um, I feel like, I don't know, I feel like, again, a lot of the time we overcomplicate it. Because you do not have to come up with your own fantasy word. You're not Tolkien, no one's expecting you to be Tolkien. So with that in mind, here are some ridiculously simple things that I have done in the past to lead to place names that I'm fairly happy with. First, take two descriptive words and just smash them together. This is how a lot of places get their names in the real world. Is this town in a forest by a creek? Call it Shady Brook. Is it a fortress on a clifftop? Crag Keep. Is this the only bridge over a raving, <laughs> raving, only bridge over a raging river? Whitewater Crossing. It's honestly, it's, it's so simple and easy and fun to do. Give it a go. You end up with place names that are like, they have this sort of very classic old school fantasy flavor in my opinion. System number two that I use all the time. Pick a word that doesn't sound like a name and make it be a name. Think about what this place represents in your setting and then just use a word associated with that concept. Fortune, uh, respite, burden. I have a city setting that I use where the key premise is that magic is so advanced here that the populace feel like they don't need gods. We make our own miracles. And so I called the city Miracle. Boom, easy. Danzo. Number three, if you do want a place name that isn't quite so straightforward, I suppose, as those other two systems, this is a trick that I use. Often for the basis of a city, I'll hop on Google Maps and I'll just start browsing around cities around the world, um, usually from places that have um, a sort of core language that isn't my own. I look for cities that my players won't be familiar with, 
and I go, okay, great. Um, I'm basing this place on Sao Luis in Brazil, right? Then I pick a couple of notable geographical features from that city. You know, it might be forest or bay or hill. And then I start looking up those words in that language. So a harbor city based on Sao Luis in Brazil. So I'm looking up uh, the words for, I chose sea and sky in Portuguese. I apologize, I'm about to butcher Portuguese. I really, I am very sorry. So the word for sea is Mara. Oh no. <laughs> so the word for sea is ma. Mar. And the word for sky is so. So. Because then I start um, adding and shifting the, the letters and sounds in those words until I come up with something that sounds like its own thing. Something that could feasibly be a city name. In this case, Maracheu. When it comes to world building, I have a lot of love for the power of, of sort of consistent choices in naming conventions. There are actually some examples from the 5e player's handbook that surprised me with how good they are because I mean, what I, okay. So I don't usually love the names that come up in like D&D adventures. Uh, I'm, I'm very sorry, but I, they're, they're pretty rubbish. I'll, I'll be real with you, they're pretty rubbish. But if you read this stuff in the player's handbook, the naming guides for, for the different ancestries, there's some pretty cool stuff in there. I was pretty hyped about it. Specifically, I'm thinking of, of tiefling naming conventions. There's a lot of cool, flavorful stuff in there, right? There's, there's this little section that says, some tieflings striving to find a place in the world adopt a name that signifies a virtue or other concept and then try to embody that concept. For some, the chosen name is a noble quest. For others, it's a grim destiny. Their examples include names like excellence, sorrow, and carrion. Ooh! Ooh, that's the good stuff right there. I feel like calling these virtue names is almost but not quite right. A virtue name is like grace faith, joy, temperance, um, earnest. It's, it's a quality that you hope that your child will embody. And also most of them are readily recognized as names now. But I think the most fascinating angle on these tiefling names for me is that there's this sort of through line um, that looks to the future, that makes it more of a prediction of where that person's life will take them. Things they'll seek out, where they'll wind up. I personally um, scrapped the aspect of uh, these individuals taking the names on themselves. That's fine, there's nothing wrong with it. But there's just, there's some Something, there's something so juicy in the concept of a parent naming their child sorrow because that's what they think their child's future is going to be. Following this tiny little segment of advice, I've ended up with tiefling characters named Answer and what's the other guy's name? <laughs> and Massacre. And I feel like even in those little morsels, you get a hint of wider world building, right? It tells you something about the families of those individuals. And then that tells you something about the, the broader tiefling culture, the traditions those families come from. I am fully aware that I, I just told you not to organize your NPC naming lists by ancestry. But you know what? This is my video and I'm gonna contradict myself as much as I damn well please. Come at me. Dragons are another place where I feel like you can sneak in a lot of world building and, and deeper roots into your naming conventions. How are dragons named in your setting? Do you take a, a Tolkien-esque approach where you give them names like Smorg and Glaurung? Proper names that identify them as, as beings of recognition, names that carry respect and awe and fear. Matt and the folks over at MCDM have a really particular pattern of naming their dragons and dragonborn. You might have seen the way that Matt, you know, delivers dialogue from his dragonborn. They all talk like this. That's a really good impression. It's really good. Um, don't question it. That's if you haven't seen Matt do it, then you wouldn't know. But it was really perfect, and I, yeah, I wouldn't look it up at all if I were you because it was perfect. His reasoning for this voice is that uh, they're talking with a mouth that isn't human, right? And I feel like you see that in this pattern of naming. You see these, these bizarre twists of syllables and, and difficult, unusual consonants. These are names that seem like they were meant to be pronounced by a mouth that isn't shaped like a human's mouth. They have dragons like Kithrian Neronazir, Koravaxenar, Erdazavarax, 
it makes dragons in the world of MCDM seem alien or, or beyond the reach of human speech and therefore by extension beyond human power, to a certain degree beyond human comprehension. For me in my games one thing that I've tried is a setting where dragons are more bestial than sort of cerebral beings, but they are also singular. Every dragon is the only dragon of its kind. Actually that does something as well already. Think about the difference between naming something a red dragon versus naming it the red dragon. Right? As a result, these dragons have names applied to them by the people around those areas just over the generations. These dragons gather titles like reputations. So for my own stuff, I've ended up with dragon names like Providence the Reef Drake, Luck Spirit, Lightning Strike, The Great Worm, Earthborn, Tireless, Stone Ancient. Breyag, Deathless, Mountain Bread, Man Killer. You know, it's interesting now that I'm reading those aloud, I, I realize how much inspiration I kind of implicitly took from classical Greek and Roman mythology and the epithets of the heroes and gods there. The point I'm trying to make is that you can see how um, choosing to use consistent naming conventions about something that's meant to be a big deal in your setting, like if dragons are a big deal in your setting, Using consistent naming conventions can tell your players something about those beings. Now, I think that it would be terribly off-brand of me uh, to not bring up the power of naming and its relation to fairies. Let's refresh for the class. It is broadly accepted across folklore surrounding the Fae and, and sometimes other magical beings as well, that if you know their true name, if you learn their true name, then you gain power and control over them. Lest we forget what happened to poor Rumpelstiltskin. This sort of thing gets transferred over to demons a lot of the time as well. In MCDM's Kingdoms and Warfare, the Lords of Hell have true names that if your party can discover them and apply them in the heat of combat, it can really turn the tide against them. My favorite example lists the true name as like a couple of bars of sheet music, like there's a treble clef and you gotta, you have to hum or sing it at the table in order to apply the true name because that's what it is. Mm, that, that is evocative. So anyway, ouch. <laughs> So anyway, names are of central importance to a fey or demonic figure like that. What I'm about to say is going to sound fairly stupid, so I'm just gonna need you to bear with me for a minute because it's like the naming of cats. The naming of cats is a difficult matter. It isn't just one of your holiday games. You may think at first I'm as mad as a hatter when I tell you a cat must have three different names. First, there's the name that the family use daily, such as Peter, Augustus, Alonzo, or James, such as Victor, or Jonathan, George, or Bill Bailey, all of them sensible, everyday names. There are fancier names if you think they sound sweeter, some for the gentlemen, some for the dames, such as Plato, Admetus, Electra, Demeter, but all of them sensible, everyday names. But I tell you a cat needs a name that's particular, a name that's peculiar and more dignified. Else how can he keep up his tail perpendicular, or spread out his whiskers, or cherish his pride? Of names of this kind I can give you a quorum, such as Munkastrap, Quaxo, or Curricapat, such as Bombalurina or else Jelly Lorum, names that never belong to more than one cat. But above and beyond, there's still one name left over, and that is the name that you never will guess. The name that no human research can discover, but the cat himself knows and will never confess. When you notice a cat in profound meditation, the reason, I tell you, is always the same. His mind is engaged in a rapt contemplation of the thought, of the thought, of the thought of his name. His ineffable, effable, effin ineffable, deep and inscrutable, singular name. I put it to you that just like the Jellicle cats, Faye have an inborn understanding, innate knowledge of their true name. I like to think of it as this intense point of difference between Faye and mortals, because mortals 
don't know their true name, right? We all have given names. And doesn't that phrase feel like it takes on a slightly different color when you put it in this context? I kind of like the suggestion that comes with it that knowing your true name allows you access to true magic. And that's why Faye will always have a, a closer, more intense relationship with magic than mortals can. It's just inherent, it's part of them. They know their true name, they know true magic. But the mortal races, because they do not know their own true name, they're protected from ever being controlled by it. All right, that's enough waxing lyrical for one day. How do we name a fairy? Personally, I think that giving them a really alien sounding name backfires flavor wise because you end up with, with something too elfy that sounds like it could genuinely be a fairy's name, their real name. But of course, fairies don't operate in that way because names have so much power over them they wouldn't feel the desire to give others a handle to call them by. So then mortals who interact with them are left to come up with names to call them by. I love thinking about how many fairy names in folklore sound so human and yet not quite human. There are a couple of odd things humans tend to do. I mean, at least if you're coming from sort of an Anglo English speaking background, where if we don't know a person's name, we will just provide a common one for them. Tom, Dick and Harry, John Doe, Average Joe. We have names that almost mean anyone or everyone. Another thing we do is we apply descriptors to differentiate between two people with the same common name based on things like what they look like, where they're from, habitual behavior. Which Mike? Tall Mike. British Mike. Mike with the annoying laugh. And trickling into our fairy tales, you see this odd little twisting on that. A little slipping of expectation. We give the everyman hero a name like Jack, so he could be anybody. But then we apply descriptors like O'Lantern or the Giant Killer. Little signals, perhaps, of the adventures these everyman heroes have on the borders of the perilous realms. When it comes to folkloric names that float to the top for fairies, we do something really similar. We reach for something ordinary, but then we end up with a result that isn't something we would usually use to describe a person. We end up with Jack Frost, Jenny Greenteeth, Robin Goodfellow. There's something in the, in the dysfunction between the mundane and the strange being juxtaposed so directly within the one name that just feels so eternally fey to me. Susanna Clark nails this kind of naming of fairies in Jonathan Strange and Mr. Narl. I do recommend it. I know the start is hard to get through, but it's a no bolts. It gets so intense tense in the climax. I just, I recommend it. I think it's good. But one of the things that Susanna Clarke smashes out of the park is naming fairies. The way that a person with no name to apply to this figure has to just come up with something that seems appropriate, even if the words you're using logically shouldn't make sense. The gentleman with the thistle down hair. Dick come Tuesday. Cold Henry. Names applied from the outside that develop over time based on what they do, places they inhabit, how and when they appear. I just, just, just try it out. Just try it out. It's, I promise you, it is not as hard as it might appear. William Heartstrings. Twilight Maggie. The Whistling Lord of the Gallows. Right, just just take something normal and then and then staple to it something that is distinctly not normal. Maybe I'll make your la cheat sheet. Check the description for it. I don't know if I did that or not. It's anyway. I technically do have more notes on this stuff, uh, including a quote from Cora about the many names of Gandalf. But I I think that uh, we've already covered all of the best stuff. So I'm gonna let you go. I'm gonna end it there. Early mark. You're welcome. If you enjoyed the video, please engage with the YouTube buttons to appease the almighty algorithm. Like, subscribe, comment a fairy name that you came up with. Ah, eh? consider clicking through to another Monarchs Factory video in the sidebar. These are the things that make a huge difference in how a YouTube video performs, so I thank you. I'm on Instagram and at least until it implodes, Twitter. So if you want to keep up with my uh, adventures elsewhere, you can follow me on those places. You can also join the community over on Discord. If you want to support the channel fiscally speaking, we do have a merch store and a Patreon. 
and YouTube members, actually patrons and YouTube members have been getting access to these videos a little, little bit early. That's been something I've been doing. Plus, if you're a YouTube member, you get access to uh, channel specific little emotes that are really cute that were that were drawn for me by Mama Monstrosity. So all of those links are in the description below. I know that was that was a whole diatribe of like blech, but I do really appreciate everyone who does the little bits that they can to help the channel out and support me here. These are heart fingers just for you. Apart from that, I do believe that's it. I'm done. Email this to your grandma. I'll see you some other time. I gotta I gotta roll out of here. I gotta eh, eh. I'm out of here. You can't stop me. Actually, you know what? The gentleman, you remember the gentleman, right? He's not with me right now. Uh, he's got his own things going on, but he, fun fact, has a true name. I know it and I'll never share it with you because it just seems wrong to give you that kind of power over him.